There is coming a day, Scripture guarantees it, when you will long enjoy the work of your hands. Maybe, maybe you're like, man, I just know in my bones God made me be an astronaut. But for whatever reason, made that impossible, and I'm working three jobs, and I hate all of them. There's coming a day when you're going to long enjoy the work of your hands. And in the meantime, work heartily at whatever it is that you do, knowing that there are eternal rewards coming to you. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey. Today on the show, Jordan Rayner is on and he's back. I should say that because he was also on our show in 2022. We'll put some links down there. If you love his conversation and the work that he does, be sure and watch our episode from last year. Really good. Here's why I like Jordan is because a, he's a really good interviewer and I told him that um, after the show many times, but he has great content and it is really, really applicable to where we are today. And so his new book, The Sacredness of Secular Work, um, actually came out January 30th, Four Ways Your Job Matters for Eternity, Even When You're Not Sharing the Gospel. And this conversation is really great because we talk a lot about why what we do today actually matters for eternity. And if you're anything like me, there are so many things I do in my everyday life that if I'm honest, I'll be like, how does this matter? Really, Jordan? Like, are you just saying this or does it really matter? And so he really goes through and talks about how these things do matter. Uh, he talks about how we have been selling people a half version of the gospel, not an untrue version, a half version. So you need to stick around to watch that. Um, if you're interested, you can get his book wherever you find books, The Sacredness of Secular Work. Here's my conversation with Jordan Rayner. Jordan, welcome back to the happy hour. Jamie. It is a happy joy to be back with you on the happy hour. I was just looking and I was like, you were here in March of 2023. Yeah. Now you're back here in early 2024. Do we just need to say you're going to come on every year? Is this what Let's this put is? like a 12 month recurring calendar invite out there. Why not? Yeah. I mean, why not? You have great <laughs> things to say. I love having you on the show. There it is. So there it is. Welcome. Now back. we got to get you on my show. Oh, I would love that. Okay. I'm holding you to that. Okay. Tell everyone about your show. Yeah, so the flagship show is called the Mere Christians Podcast. That's who I create content for. Uh, I create content for you if you're not a pastor, you're not a religious professional, you are a mere Christian working as an entrepreneur or a barista or a teacher or a mechanic. I want to help you see the sacredness of your seemingly secular work. And that's what we unpack every week on the Mere Christians Podcast. I love it. Okay, I want to I want to say this. I've never even had this conversation with anyone, but the, the word mere, M-E-R-E, yeah. To me, when I hear that word, I know this isn't true. I think less than. I, I think little. I think, oh, you little bitty old Christian over there. Why do I think that? Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess that's part of the definition of this word is like humble. Okay. Like the way I'm using this word, though, is, hey, you're not being paid to talk about Jesus. No, I get it, and I love it. <laughs> yes. Just, but, yeah, it's, by the way, like, nobody uses this word. No. So, like, when I say it, people are like, you and, like, mirror Lewis. as in, like, looking in the mirror, Christian? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I'm just blatantly stealing from Lewis. That's yes, yes. all I'm doing here. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, I think that's really great because, honestly, Jordan, here's the deal. Most people who are following Jesus in the world fall into that. Let's not even Jesus say Jesus fell into that category. <laughs> okay, there you go. Je okay, Jesus. how do you say that? Wasn't Jesus like special and think, like think, teaching let's, let's and all kinds of this. stuff? Let's think about this. We, we're recording this first week of January. We just celebrated Christmas, right? Yes. God in his sovereignty could have chosen for Jesus to grow up in anybody's home. He could have grown up in the home of a priest like John the Baptist, mm -hmm. where he would spend all day long on the spiritual task of prayer. Yeah. He could have chosen for Jesus to grow up in the home of a Pharisee like Paul, where he would spend all day long studying Torah. But instead, he intentionally chose for Jesus to grow up in the home of a small business owner named Joseph, where he spent 80% of his adult life, most scholars estimate, doing a job that looks a whole lot like the work that you and I do as mere Christians yep. today. And if, I mean, that in and of itself helps me see the sacredness of my seemingly secular work. But obviously I wrote this book to go way deeper in helping believers see that truth. It's so true. And I, I read a book um, a couple of years ago by Alicia Britt Choley. Are you familiar with her? I'm not. She's phenomenal. You need to be familiar with her. I can't remember which book of it, her, of it that I read of hers, which book it was, but she talks about how, most of Jesus's life was in the unseen, you know, like we see like a couple of scenes in the beginning, 
birth, the temple, and then we skip like 27. I mean, we skipped a lot of years. Yeah. And then he shows up at 30 and we see three years. Yeah. And I'm like, that just shows us exactly what you're just saying is like, hey, there's so much beauty and goodness within our daily, everyday, mere Christian life. Yes. Well, think about this. At the baptism. Mm-hmm. Before Jesus launches his public ministry, comes out of the waters and his heavenly father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. What was the, what was his father well pleased with? Mm. We only know basically two things about Jesus from the age of 12 to the age of 30. It's that he was obedient to his parents and he grew in wisdom and stature and he worked as a carpenter. That's it. Yeah. So apparently what pleased this heavenly father was just simple everyday obedience in a regular J-O-B, right? Like that's encouraging to me. Yep. As a Gurdjie, anyone who feels like they're in that white space in between the highlights uh, of the uh, of their life. You know why that's encouraging too, Jordan? I seem to talk about social media a lot, and I always preface it with, I love social media. I love Instagram. I love the internet. It's where you and I do our jobs. It is so helpful, all the things. And at the same time, there's a big tension there that we all have to hold. And the fact is that most of our mundane things, no one's putting on the on the gram, you know, yeah. because guess what? Who cares that Nobody's I fed my liking kids a dinner picture last of my daily night? Run. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so, but there is so much beauty in that. And so, I think what we have to do as Christians, and you do a really good job of talking about this, is realize that those things matter, and that it's not this outward how many likes did you get that matter, but it is what you do. Which leads me to your new project um, called "The Sacredness of Secular Work: Four Ways Your Job Matters for Eternity, Even When You're Not Sharing the Gospel." And great, great book. Um, so encouraged by it, all the things. I want to start at the beginning and yeah. let's start here. Let's define a couple of terms yeah. so that we're all on the same page here. When you say the sacredness of secular work, what are you yeah. defining work as? Yeah, so I'm not defining it exclusively as the thing you get paid to do because I think God defines work far more broadly than that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, God defines work so broadly that in Exodus 20, verse 10, when he's handing down the Ten Commandments, he says that even animals work. The Sabbath command is a command for humans to rest from their labor, as are the animals commanded. So I, I think the most biblical way to define work is maybe by what it's not, right? It is the opposite of leisure and rest. It is anything you do to expend energy in an effort to achieve a desired result. And that definition of work includes what you do for pay, but it also includes laundry. Yeah, and, and they, nobody paying grass. me for that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's paying me for that or studying for exam, whatever. Yeah, all of this is work, and all of it matters for eternity, not just the quote unquote spiritual tasks mm. of evangelism and prayer that I do as I do my job. Yeah, it almost makes me think that I think about someone like my grandmother, and you and I before we started recording, we're talking about your grandmother, and I think about my grandmother. She's passed, and she was a wonderful woman, and I just think about how many amazing things she did that nobody knows about. Like, I don't even probably know half of them because I didn't spend a lot of my life with her, but I just remember every time I would go visit her, she volunteered in her church library. Remember when, libra remember when churches had libraries? I love I it so much. There's still a handful of these around. It's shocking. <laughs> I think they should come back. I'm always <laughs> like, I love a library. But my grandmother volunteered there, and she volunteered at her local crisis pregnancy center. And I'm just like, those are her everyday moments that matter for eternity. So another thing I want you to... Um, define for us before we move on is the word secular. Yeah. And I think that's a word that um, a lot of people throw around, but could be confused by it. Does it mean yeah. like, like I remember when I was younger, I would hear it. I'd be like, Satan, does this mean yeah. Satan work? Right, like, exactly. what does this mean? Which, so is scary, that for us. Yeah. which is scary given that most mere Christians describe their work as secular. Oh, I have a secular job. I work in a secular workplace, mm. but that word secular literally means without God or with no regard for religion. But we Christians believe that the creator God is literally with us mm. wherever we go through the power of his Holy Spirit. And so the only thing a believer needs to do to instantly make their quote unquote secular workplace sacred is walk through the front door or mm. log on to Zoom. That's it. Mm -hmm. Period. Full stop. Now, clearly some work is off limits for Christ followers, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that our listeners are not peddling pornography or exploiting the poor, right? Yeah. And good. if that's true and you are seeking first the kingdom of God, then in the words of the great Charles Spurgeon, quote, nothing is secular 
Mm. Everything is sacred. There's no question about the sacredness of your seemingly secular work believer. I think the more interesting and life-changing question is, how does that sacred work matter beyond the present? How in the world does leading a Zoom meeting or creating a spreadsheet or changing a diaper matter for eternity? And that's the question I'm trying to help readers answer mm. in this book, The Sacredness of Secular Work. I think that that question is hard for a lot of reasons, Jordan. Number one, like we have bought into a bunch of lies that what we do doesn't really matter beyond today. Um, and number two, I think it often feels like it doesn't matter beyond today. I mean, if I'm honest, the things that have seemed so mundane in my world, I have a hard time feeling like, how does this matter for eternity? Like, I feel like sometimes I remember I was telling a friend the other day, I was like a lot of motherhood and a lot of my listeners will relate to this feels like Groundhog Day. I, I it literally, I remember when the kids were little, I'm like, I'm doing the exact same thing I did yesterday, yep. like over yep. and over. In fact, one of Aaron and I's biggest fights was he was like, let's clean the living room up every day. And I was like, I don't understand why it's going to look the exact same way tomorrow. Yep. That's yep. besides the point. But a lot of it can feel mundane as so we don't feel that way. So I, let's have the conversation. Yep. How does our job matter for eternity? You go through the book and you lay out four yep. different ways. The one I really, really, really want to talk about is number four, but I want you to tell me. Oh, come on now. I well, know. Let's tell me a high level overview of the four. Perfect. Okay? Perfect. Four ways your job matters for eternity. The job you have now, right? As a mere Christian, number one, your work matters for eternity because it is a vehicle for bringing God eternal pleasure. Now, God doesn't need anything from us, right? But in his goodness and grace, he allows us to contribute to his eternal delight. Listen to Psalm 37, 23. It says that the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. In other words, God doesn't just delight in watching you use your job to write a check to your church. He doesn't just delight in watching you walk a coworker through the Romans road. He delights in every diaper you change, in every Zoom meeting you lead. Anything you do in a godly way, in accordance with God's commands, is an ingredient to the eternal pleasure of God. That's the first way your work matters for eternity. That makes me smile. That makes Come me smile. On. That makes me like, oh, that you would care so much, God, about my little bitty life over here. That's so kind of him, you know? And it's it makes me think, Jordan, you have kids, don't you? I do. Yeah, so like I, even this morning, like we're still on Christmas break, so my kids sleep till like, I don't know, like the afternoon. I'm like, <laughs> hey, you missed half the day, guys. But I kind of, I had some work this morning, then I came home to make lunch and one of my sons walked in. And I remember just feeling delight as I saw him. I was like, Oh, there you are. I delight in you. And that's what kind of like you're talking about. It's like God delights in us in, in that first one. It's so I love it so much. That's exactly right. Yeah. Second way your work matters for eternity is because it is largely through our work that we will earn eternal rewards. This is a topic that this is I a tricky never one. hear preached on. It's tricky because the prosperity gospel has heretically perverted mm -hmm. this, right? Prosperity gospel says, hey, you'll be re rewarded now. Jesus did not promise us our best life now. He promised us our best life later if we will obey his command to sacrifice in the present and chase after eternal rewards like mm. treasures, mm -hmm. like crowns that people are familiar with. But scripture also makes clear that there are increased job responsibilities for our eternal vocation on the new earth that is part of our reward. Isaiah 60 alludes to this idea that one of our eternal rewards is the literal work of our hands surviving judgment and lasting forever and ever on the new earth, which boggles my mm -hmm. mind, right? Yeah. So that's the second way your work matters for eternity. It is a way that you store up eternal rewards. Way number three is your work matters because through it, you can scratch off glimpses of the eternal kingdom of God in the present. And then finally, number four, what you want to sink our teeth into. Your work matters for eternity because you can leverage your job to the instrumental end of sharing the gospel with those you work with. And I argue in the book, that ever since the beginning of this whole thing we call Christianity, it has always, always, always been near Christians and not quote unquote full-time missionaries, not quote unquote pastors who've been the most effective at making disciples. And I cite a bunch of data to make that case. And I would argue that's going to continue to be true for at least this next generation when non-Christians are less likely than ever before to darken the door of a church to learn about Jesus. 
mm. for the first time. So how are they going to hear about them? Through you and me mm. working next to them in the public school system, working next to them in the local coffee shop and the local mechanic shop, wherever it is. And that's a serious way that our work is going to matter and make a significant dent into the shape of the kingdom of God. I love that so much. Um, a friend of mine, David Platt, talks a lot about reaching the unreached people groups around the world. And he always, he'll he'll say like, you know, people will say to him, oh, but like, I, I live in, you know, I live in Austin and Austin is unreached and the people in my, in my uh, office building are unreached. And he's like, no, they're not because they have you. Like they have you sitting next to them in the cubicle every single day. And that is one of the things you're talking about is that we get to leverage the gospel through our work that we do. So let's talk about that real quick. Yeah. I wanted to dive into that one. You um, start off that part of this book with um, William Wilberforce telling a story about him. And then you go in and you talk about two ditches that a lot of Christians will fall into. So I'd love to, us to talk about these two ditches that Christians often find themselves falling into. And you tell the story about how William Wilberforce avoided both of those. But let's talk about ditch number one. Yeah. Do you want me to say them or you want to say them? You, you say it. Go I ahead. I got them. You, you got number, a prettier voice than I do. Ditch number one, believing that the only action of eternal significance are those that we leverage to the instrumental end of sharing the gospel. Yeah. And so talk about this ditch right here that people fall into sometimes. Oh, I think this is super common. When, when, when I tell um, – when I tell a mere Christian that their work matters for eternity, the most frequent response I get is, oh, yeah, amen, my job is my mission field, right? And that is absolutely 100% true. We're going to talk about that when we get to ditch number two. But if that's the only way your work matters for eternity, right, then frankly, that's pretty depressing because mm -hmm. I don't, how much time in a 30-day period, in a month, do we spend explicitly sharing the gospel with the lost people around us? 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. An hour? Let's be like – crazy generous and say it's three hours that means one percent of your time matters for eternity that is deeply depressing mm. and more importantly it's deeply unbiblical and we can go way deep into that but psalm 37 23 alone helps make that case everything you do in a godly way everything you do with excellence and love and in accordance with god's commands at a minimum matters for eternity because it contributes to god's pleasure which is eternal Right. I think we'll even fuel our interactions with the risen Christ on the new earth. So I see a lot of Christians in this ditch believing that, yeah, one percent of my time matters for eternity because those are the times that I spend sharing the gospel. And that's a lie. And here's why this is so important. Ironically, it is when you understand that 100 percent of your time in this life matters for eternity you actually share the gospel more, not mm. less. Why? Because people who understand that all of it matters to God, that all of it has the potential to make him smile, those people are fully alive when they're making lattes at the local coffee shop or teaching math to seventh graders. Mm. And fully alive people attract the lost like craft coffee it attracts hipsters, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's what the world wants to see. So we got to avoid ditch number one of believing that the only actions of eternal significance are those we leverage to share the gospel. But to your point, we also got to avoid ditch number two, being so content with the intrinsic value of our work that we rarely, if ever, leverage our work to the instrumental end of sharing the gospel mm -hmm. And Wilberforce was a master at avoiding these two ditches, as you already mm. pointed out. It's like they're on two different sides, yeah. and we got to find a way to get in the middle. And so what is that way for us to get into the middle with our work, knowing that it matters because we get to share the gospel with people we work with? Yeah, I, listen, I, I, I think the way we stay in the middle of the road is just remembering the biblical truths that I'm expounding upon in this book that prove that our work matters even when not leveraged to instrumental ends. But the other way we do it is, yeah, by redeeming our time. We talked about my last book, Redeeming Your Time, on this mm -hmm. show. Redeeming our time and looking for opportunities to move from the surface to the serious to the spiritual with the lost people we encounter at work, in our neighborhoods, in our community. We've, we've got to all see ourselves – as full-time missionaries, mm. right? Like that, that term is so absurd. Yeah. Like every Christian should see themselves, should embrace their role as a full-time missionary. When Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, any theologian will tell you that translation of that word go is actually a pretty poor translation of the Greek. A better translation is as you are going, make disciples of all nations. Go is not a command. 
right? The going is assumed. Jesus is saying, hey, you've already gone. Now, as you're going about whatever that trade it is, as a full-time missionary or as a fisherman or as a tax collector or as whatever, make disciples as you go about that work. Mm, that makes me think about something else you wrote in your book that I didn't even have in my notes to talk about, but I, I found it very interesting about how you talked about the Great Commission yeah. and how we have kind of um, confused it a little bit with, yeah. with what Jesus was saying. So can you expound on that? Yeah, I, I, there, I think there's a ton of confusion around this text. I, I, I think one point of confusion is that this commission to make disciples has somehow canceled out every other command that Jesus gave us. Like this is uh, the only thing he's asking of us. Yeah, I think we treat it that way a lot of times. We're like, hey, listen, how many baptisms did we have this month? How many souls did we save? And that's incredibly important, right? But we can't treat it as the only commission Jesus gave us because Jesus didn't say it's the only thing we're supposed to do. In fact, in Matthew 28, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, dot, 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 teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you to do. Jesus called us to care for the poor. Jesus mm -hmm. called us to do justice. Jesus called us to love our neighbor as ourselves. All of that matters to God, mm -hmm. right? I think our second misinterpretation of the Great Commission is in who is obeying the Great Commission, right? I've sat in a lot of church services and felt a lot of guilt because I wasn't literally going to move to a mud hut 5,000 mm -hmm. miles away from home to make disciples. But when you, again, when you study that original Greek, that term go is better understood as having gone or as you are going, make disciples. The, and the what you're doing every day. And what you're doing you're every day. And oh, by the way, oh, by the way, Jesus didn't go more than 200 miles away from his own hometown. Mm. He's the greatest disciple maker of all time. It wasn't yeah. about how far he went. It was about what he did while he was going. The same is true for you and me. The Great Commission is not something that we just obey on short-term mission trip or when we enter the halftime of our career to take a job as a full-time missionary. The Great Commission ought to be something that we are obeying every single day as we go about whatever vocation God has placed in our hearts to do for his glory and the good mm. of others. It makes me think also, I heard someone one time, they were talking about people going to be missionaries. And by the way, I'm assuming you, I'm going to say me as well. No one's saying that that's not good or right. No, we're saying, hey, I support missionaries 100%, overseas. Yeah. Me too, yeah. But someone was saying, hey, if you cannot share the gospel in your everyday life where you live, what makes you think you're going to be able to do it in, in Asia or India or North word. Africa? And so it is just this idea. Now, the, the problem with that, and you alluded to it a little bit, Jordan, is a lot of, and this goes back to our first conversation about what does it mean to be a mere Christian? Yeah. A lot of, I mean, I don't, a lot of churches, a lot of communities, a lot of people have often made people feel the way you just said you have felt before as if, hey, here's the A team or here's the varsity right. team. The varsity team are the ones that are either on stages or are going around the world. Everyone else, we're glad you're here. We'll put you in the game if we need you, but we got the varsity team. And um, I just think that is doing a disservice to most of the world, like you mentioned. And so I would go further than that. I would argue it's accusing God of failure because if team varsity are religious professionals, God made a mistake in choosing for Jesus to grow up as a carpenter. Mm. Should have put him someplace else then. Yeah. And oh, by the way, like we, we love to celebrate the story of, of Peter laying down his nets and following Jesus as we should. Right. But let's not forget that just as frequently in the gospel biographies, we see Jesus calling people to go back into the jobs they had before they followed him. Zacchaeus' case in point. When Zacchaeus repents, right, he says, Lord, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to quit my job, but I'm going to change how I do my job. I'm going to repay back everybody for what I stolen from them four times as much. Jesus does not say, no, 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 buddy, come follow me as a full-time donor supported missionary. He says, today salvation has come to this home, mm -hmm. right? You don't need to be a donor supported missionary to obey the Great Commission. You can be a full-time missionary as you go about the thing God created us to do in the beginning, see Genesis 1. The first commission to fill the earth and to subdue it. In other words, to simply make this world more useful and beautiful for other human beings, which is exactly what you listener do every day as a musician, as an artist, 
as an entrepreneur, as an executive, you are leaning into the first commission of Genesis one that God never once retracted. There's a nasty lie in the church today. It says somehow the great commission has replaced that first commission. That's a lie. And you know how what we do know you mean? We what fast- are they, what are they saying? What's the lie they're saying? The, the, the lie great- I hear a lot of pastors saying is, Hey, I, I'll give you a direct quote. Okay. I'll give you a direct quote from a pastor. I otherwise love. Okay. Not going to share his name because Thank I you. love his work. I would have beeped it out, but anyhow, I know <laughs> he said, quote, the consequences of your mission in the context of this quote is he's talking exclusively about the great, great commission, right? The consequences of your mission will last forever. The consequences of your job will not end quote. In other words, Hey, that first commission doesn't matter anymore. All that matters is saving mm. souls and getting us all the heck out of here. That's a lie. God never retracts that first commission, even after the fall. In Genesis 1, he says, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 3, work becomes difficult, but God still commands it in the context of blessing. Genesis 9, 1, no one family hop off the ark. Some of God's first words are what? Fill the earth. He's reissuing this first commission. And then when we fast forward to the end of this age in Revelation 22, 5, It says that work is going to be a part of our eternal reality. Eternity is not a vacation. It is a perfect vocation without the curse. Isaiah 65 says that we will long enjoy the work of our hands, end quote, with Christ on the new earth. And if that's true, then clearly my work leaning into the first commission today must have value to God in addition to this great commission that he's given me to make disciples as I go about my work in that first commission. You know, I think a lot of people, you con- you talk about this in your book as well. And I've heard people discuss this saying that like our story begins in Genesis three, Oh, you know? <clears throat> and so this is where we began. This is where our life began. This is where our story begins, but we're leaving out actually the like purpose and plan and perfect story that God created for us, which then we see, come to culmination at the end of revelation as well so is that that's kind of what you're talking about as well that's exactly so we skip what over that's that exactly what i'm talking about in the last 200 years of church history for the first time ever we've begun preaching an abridged version of the gospel of jesus christ that goes something like this the this gospel is interesting is the, in your book okay the gospel is the it. good news that jesus came to save you and me from our sins mm-hmm. and listen every word of that is of course gloriously true 100 percent. it's tragically incomplete it starts at genesis 3 and ends at easter we sinned christ saved us the rest of creation be damned Mm -hmm. that's not the unabridged gospel that we see from genesis 1 to revelation 22 and to put it real 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 succinctly the gospel is not just good news for our souls and the spiritual realm The gospel is good news for the entire cosmos, including this material earth that God plans not to destroy, but to redeem. And here's why that matters for you and me today. If Jesus' blood was sufficient to redeem my soul and the aluminum and the plants and this earth, then my work with this material world typing on MacBooks made out of aluminum from the earth, planting gardens in my backyard and building a home must matter for eternity because Jesus' blood bought it all back. He's not just Lord over the spiritual realm. God did not make a truce with Satan after Genesis 3 and say, hey, Satan, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to keep the spiritual realm. You keep the material realm and let's call it a day. That's Mm -hmm. garbage theology. Jesus Mm -hmm. is king overall and so my work and engagement and enjoyment of the spiritual and material is intrinsically good is eternal and is deeply deeply sacred it's so good i want to read what you wrote for the unabridged gospel uh let me just clarify let me say again what you said you said the abridged gospel is the gospel is the good news that jesus came to save people from their sins which you and i both would say 100 percent true nothing's Amen. false about that it's all true then you said that's not all the story the unabridged gospel is this god created a perfect world which goes back to genesis god created a perfect world and invited his children to rule over it with him and for him we send ushering in the curse that broke every part of that perfect creation ensuring our need for a savior 
Jesus's resurrection proved empathetically that he is the savior who saves us by grace through faith. And while we're not saved by our works, we have been saved for the good works that he's prepared for us to do all along, partnering with him to cultivate heaven on earth until he returns to finish the job. Then the triune God will finally dwell with us again on a new earth where he, where we will rule with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. You know, Jordan, I was reading this part and it got me thinking about how uh, the uh, the abridged gospel, like we've both said, true, true, true. It's just incomplete. But I think that growing up in the 90s, that's the gospel that I was preached. Oh, yeah. And so that's what I was taught. And so I think I've not really given this much thought, but I would imagine that getting into my, you know, late teenage years, early 20s, I just kind of thought, oh, I don't know what the big deal. Who cares? What's the big deal? Like, Okay, so Jesus saved me. And I would imagine this is why it was easy for me to say the sinner's prayer, walk down the aisle and get baptized, but my life did not look any different. Yes. Oh, you're so smart, Jamie. You're getting it. The abridged gospel is all about what Jesus has saved us from. But without Genesis 1 and Revelation 22, it's impossible to see what Jesus has saved us for. Mm -hmm. If the gospel is simply Jesus coming to save my soul, then my life between now and death doesn't matter at all. I'm just waiting around to die and be with Jesus. But if scripture is true, which you and I would say a hearty amen that it is, you and I are not just saved by grace through faith, see Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. We have been saved, see verse 10, for the good works God prepared in advance for us to do. What are the good works that God prepared in advance for us to do? See Genesis 1, partner with him in taking this garden and turn it into the garden city, i.e. cultivating heaven here on this earthly earth. You know, Jordan, I was thinking that you said you just said a while ago, like, if my work doesn't matter, then I'm just here to, to live and then die and be with Jesus and what is there. And I was thinking – Unfortunately and sadly, a lot of people feel that way and they feel that way for a lot of reasons. Maybe they have some trauma they haven't dealt with. Maybe they are literally in a job that they're like, this is, they feel like it's pointless, even though you would argue mm -hmm. that it's not. They feel like it's pointless. They feel like, what's the point? What is your encouragement to them? And I, I, I would imagine everything we've talked about should be yeah. an encouragement, but what is that thing that you'd be like, no, let me tell you this thing. This is why you can live today and it does matter. Yeah. I would say a few things. Number one, I would point you back to Psalm 37, 23. Mm. The Lord delights in every detail of your life. And if you believe his delight is eternal, that should infuse the temporal with great meaning today. I, I, think, I think the way we work and live today are going to fuel our interactions with the risen Christ on the new earth, right? Like mm. I could, I can see Christ coming up to Jamie Ivy on the new earth when Jamie is hosting episode number 2 billion of the happy hour <laughs> is a, Hey Jamie, you remember that time when you had an opportunity to serve yourself rather than your guest on that show? You knew exactly what I'm talking about and you didn't, you chose to sacrifice and, and not be self-seeking. I remember that. And I remember the smile on my father's face as you did that. Well done, good and faithful servant. All right? So that's the first thing. I point you to Psalm 37, 23. His pleasure is eternal. I think it's going to fuel us for eternity. Second, I would say, especially to the person who hates their job today, there is coming a day, Scripture guarantees it. See Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 23, when you will long enjoy the work of your hands. Maybe... Maybe you're like, man, I just know in my bones, God made me be an astronaut. But for whatever reason, I grew up in a time and place and economic circumstances that made that impossible. And I'm working three jobs and I hate all of them. There's coming a day when you're going to long enjoy the work of your hands. And in the meantime, see Colossians 3, 23 and 24, work heartily at whatever it is that you do, knowing that there are eternal rewards coming to you. Those are the mm. two things I would say. Mm, it's so good. Um, I want to talk about one more thing before we yep. go. <clears throat> and it was something that I found um, not only interesting, but also encouraging. I think a lot of people are going to be encouraged by it is you tell a story in the book and I don't have it in front of me. So you're gonna have to fill in the blanks here about someone who was um, 
creating a new company to help with maybe sex trafficking victims. Yeah. Okay. And so they're trying to raise money. So will you tell that story? Because I think a lot of times people can get on the flip side of the two ditches that we talk about. People yeah. can feel like, well, if we're not telling about Jesus every single yep. day, every minute, then what are we doing? Nothing matters. Kind of like maybe the quote that you mentioned from that unsaid pastor about our jobs not mattering. So can yeah. you tell that story? Yeah, it's such a perfect example of the, the the dangers of the abridged gospel. So my friend Victor Boutros runs this incredible organization called the Human Trafficking Institute. Basically, they go into developing countries and set up law enforcement units in those countries to prosecute human traffickers. There, there are anti-trafficking laws on the books literally in every country on earth. The issue isn't the law. It's law enforcement. And so, for example, in Uganda alone, the Human Trafficking Institute, <laughs> their work led to a 225% increase in the number of traffickers successfully prosecuted one year after putting boots on the ground. Mm. So I was talking with a member of the HTI team on the fundraising team, and he was telling me this story. He's like, oh, man, I was sharing this data about Uganda with this prospective donor, this – we'll call him Richard, this Christian guy, wealthy Christian guy named Richard. And he's like walking through the data and Richard's like blown away. He's like, oh my gosh, this is like incredible work. And the fundraiser's like, oh my gosh, this guy's like, this is a done deal. He's going to write us a check for millions of dollars, whatever. And Richard had one final question. He just leans across the table. He's like, hey, this is a, this is a Christian organization, right? Like you guys are sharing the gospel with these victims that you pull out of human trafficking. And the fundraiser's like, uh, no, like I'm a Christian. Our founders are Christian. Many of our team are, but we legally can't share the gospel with these victims because we have official relationships with these government partners. Well, that was not the answer that Richard was looking for. Uh, he was out. And I want you, I want to read to you what the fundraiser from HTI told me. He said, I was flabbergasted, Jordan, but sadly there are many Christians like Richard who don't see how pulling these kids out of brothels matters to God it's as if the physical redemption of these kids is totally irrelevant unless mm. it also leads to their spiritual redemption. Now, that story makes our stomachs churn. But listen, we can't fault Richard because Richard has grown up in a day and age where we say that the gospel is simply Jesus' plan to save souls. And if that's true... Richard's decision is actually logical, mm. but if God cares not just about our spiritual redemption, but also the end of injustice and also freeing kids out of brothels and also beauty in this world, then man, HDI's work seems to make a whole lot more sense. So I'm so glad you brought that up. By the way, you need to have Victor Boutros on this podcast. He's All one right. of the most exceptional people I know. Love to make that connection. Okay. You know, it makes me think though, that mindset comes from the, what we talked about earlier of just taking the Great Commission, which is good and is true, and it is what we should be following. And not optional. And Exactly. And saying this is the only thing that Jesus wants us to do when you negate the whole rest of all of the Gospels and Acts and all of the things that, that the early church was doing. Just go back to what Jesus talked about. Like you just negate a lot of – and just the life that Jesus lived as well. We, I mean – Jesus spent a lot of time healing people's providing for their physical needs, you know, and getting them out of dangerous situations and, um, and making good tables. Let me, let me wrap it up real succinctly. You and I have a dual vocation today at the highest level, the great commission to make disciples and the first commission to make a whole world that is beautiful and true and just for God's glory and the good of others. So good. Jordan Rayner, so grateful. The sacredness of secular work, four ways your job matters for eternity, even when you're not sharing the gospel. Uh, such an encouragement to all of us um, who are listening, um, who just feel like, what am I doing that matters? Jordan, I'd love to know, what are you reading these days? First, let me just say this, Jordan. Yeah. I read a lot of books. Yep. Your books, I've read two of them now, are some of the most, you and John Mark Comer, I'm going to say that, are some of the most footnoted books I've yeah. ever read in my entire life. And I'm telling you that as a compliment is I read that and I go, these people are well read. And so I love it. it, it oh, I love man. it as a reader. I'm like, oh, okay. It's not just tipping his toe into something. He like literally reads about this. So I think books, I, I treat books like they're $2,000 products instead mm. of $20 products. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm not asking you to give me $20. I'm asking you to give me $20 and five hours of your life. Yeah. Gosh, it's gotta be accessible, but deep. All right. What am I reading? 
I just finished an extraordinary biography, the most recent biography on Dr. King. Oh, okay. Uh, Tell written me. Written by Jonathan Eig, E I G. Okay. It's just called King. Okay. It's a long book, something like 800 pages, but lots of footnotes. So I don't know. Yeah. Let's call it 600. <laughs> it was extraordinary. It was uh, everything a biography should be other than the length. It was entertaining. It was a quick read, but it was deeply insightful about Dr. King's um, uh, flaws uh, and his strengths. And I, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. That's awesome. I love, um, I haven't read a biography in a long time, but I love memoirs. So I love stories of people's lives. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much. It's a joy to have you on and encourage all of us knowing that what we're doing today, it does matter for eternity. Even if it feels mundane, even if it feels like, what are, what are we doing with our lives? And so I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming on the happy hour. Thank you, Jamie. Hey friends, I hope you love this conversation as much as I did. To make sure that you never miss any of the happy hour conversations, go ahead and hit the subscribe button below to make sure you're notified every time we release a new episode. And if you want more content today, click on those videos over there. I think you're going to like them just as much as you like the one today.